No, I just needed to touch that and it turned on. Cool. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Map touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, open your notes. We're going we're gonna to wrap up with um, Latin America, okay? Mostly wrap up with Latin America. We'll say some more, like, toward the end of the unit, uh, this unit on uh, Canada, Mexico, Brazil. And then I think there's some other stuff. If you look at the beginning of the handout, I was looking over this, like the uh, Panama Canal new treaty that they did in the 19, late 1970s. Okay, we'll talk about that toward the end of this. But, um, yeah, we'll wrap up with um, the Latin American part. We'll finish with the video uh, background, or Backyard, right, the last 10 minutes of that one. And then we'll get into the notes associated with episode number 19, Freeze. This is going to be like the Carter years and the relationship with the Soviet Union. And also Iran. Ooh, we're going to get into the details of Iran. And I'll tell you about one of my teaching buddies who was uh, buddies at a workplace that he used to work uh, at, who um, that buddy actually like helped get Americans out of Iran. Whoa. Guess what part of the United States government those two guys work for? Exactly, the CIA. So there was like an econ teacher at Bora High School that used to work in the CIA? Yeah. <laughs> They got stories. Yeah, so anyway, this is going to be all part of it. And, of course, then they're going to make it into a movie. And who's going to be in the movie starring it? And actually, I think he filmed it, too. Batman. Actually, do you know which actor played Batman? Kristen Bale. It was one. And then who's the other one? I have to pull that one up because my brain, sometimes I'm like, I don't remember. It was, yeah, here we go, Ben Affleck, right? Wasn't he Batman in one of the movies? He didn't do very good? Yeah, I like Ben Affleck in, um, uh, Doctor Strange? Was he in Doctor Strange? No, 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 no. Ben Affleck in the movie with Robin Williams. Um, oh, gosh. My brain is falling apart now. Remember the guy that, oh, God, forget it. I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember. Right? He's like a janitor, and he goes in, and he's brilliant, and Robin Williams is a psychologist. And, um, good Will Hunting? Good morning, Vietnam. Oh, yeah, that's what you did today. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Ben Affleck played his buddy. And the guy that was the main character was the guy that looks like me. Oh, yeah. Or I look like him when he gains like 30, 40 pounds for his roles. We already covered that one, didn't we? All right, so here we go. Yes, get at your notes. We're going to be uh, wrapping up with um, numero, okay. Yeah, are you coming in for... Got it down. Is Tuesday at lunch? Did you mean Wednesday at lunch? No. Oh. Is it Wednesday? Yes. Yeah, I was definitely did not come to school yesterday. So I couldn't, so you couldn't take it at lunch? Today. Yes, okay. Okay, we'll see you after school. Okay. Actually, is it, um, I get out of Tuesday. I'm during like the last day. Yeah, we'll just sit you in the back. Yeah, because that, that class hasn't got too many people in here. Yeah. Seventh period's got quite a few, because we got more. But eighth period is actually my, some of my smallest ones. Okay, all right, so let's look at, um, this is going to wrap up. We've already done the notes, but let's watch the uh, last part of Backyard, CNN Cold War, the Latin American part. Dude, we don't need that. Here we go. All right, so now, this is actually a good uh, uh, starting point again. We have Alexander Haig who is the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan being the new President of the United States, just sworn in January 20th, 1981. And he doesn't like Ortega and the Sandinistas. Really? Trust. Unfortunately, there was no such plan. Quite the opposite. Cuba's actions conflicted with 
I saw the women clinging to each other, crying and screaming at them not to kill them. I fought for my children. I didn't want to let them go. I said I would die with them, but they wrenched them from my arms. We heard them killing the children. They killed them at night. We could hear the screams for their mamas and papas. As the Reagan administration moved to shore up the right in El Salvador and bring down the left in Nicaragua, neighboring Honduras became a base for all sorts of U.S. activity. Honduras was the main place where a force was being trained to overthrow the government of Nicaragua. That force was the Contras. Some of them were former members of the National Guard of Nicaragua. A lot of them were just, you know, peasants from the mountainous areas between Honduras and Nicaragua who'd been at war with somebody forever. Uh, and in many respects, they were like a bunch of cattle rustlers. The Contras were funded from Washington. This undeclared war upset the U.S. Congress. An amendment by Representative Boland of Massachusetts curtailed Reagan's funds for arming the Contras. We are complying with the law, the Boland amendment, which is the law. We are complying with that fully. And, um, in we are not arming or supplying the uh, dissidents along the border of Honduras and border between Nicaragua. I am not going to get it. I could not and would not possibly talk about it. Such thing. Washington was planning another small war. On the Ron Contra was in for two years. When the British Queen Elizabeth was still head of state, a left wing government was yeah. Here we go, Grenada. To build a new tourist airport. The U.S. suspected a strategic motive. In October 1983, when left wing Prime Minister Morris Bishop was assassinated by more extreme Marxists, Washington had an invasion plan ready for Reagan's approval. At 5.15 this morning, the joint force landed at two spots on Grenada. There is now firing and combat uh, going on at the Hatton Castle. The United States hadn't bothered to consult the British Queen or Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. It was all over in a few days. I basically learned about the invasion of Grenada from the president of Honduras, uh, who called me up to say, do you know what's going on? And I said, well, I have, a, I have an idea, but I don't know for sure. And he said, well, uh, you're, uh, you're invading uh, Grenada. And he said, please tell the troops that when they're finished there, they just keep on coming to Nicaragua. <laughs> Many welcomed the Americans. Within six weeks, their work done and President Reagan's image enhanced, the U.S. troops left. No, oh, that's Nicaragua. <laughs> In Nicaragua, Reagan's crusade against the Sandinistas was stepped up. The Sandinistas desperately needed to get hard currency for their exports to pay off their bank loans. So this was a time to put the mines into Corinto. You only got one harbor that counts. And at the same time, make sure we notify Lloyds of London, the mines have gone in, so hopefully they put pressure on the shipping companies well there. Well, That's what happened. It worked. 
Nicaragua's precious stock of oil went up in smoke. The economy was reeling, and all the while, ways had to be found to contain the US-backed Contra invasion. The Sandinistas asked the Soviets for help. Neither the Moscow did not want to provoke the United States to even more military aid to the Contra and to the Sandunum down. Therefore, all these requests were politely denied every time the Sandinistas were brought it up in Moscow. The Sandinistas, <coughs> with help from Cuba, vowed to defend their borders and the revolution. Yep, give weapons to little kids to fight against the Contras. The success of communism in Central America poses a threat. But a hundred million people from Panama to the open border on our south could come under the control of pro-Soviet regimes. And then Red Dawn, right? Angry at Reagan's continued support for the Contra war, the U.S. Congress, again led by <laughs> Representative Boland, voted in October 1984 to deny them any further assistance. With the passage of the Boland Amendments, which ultimately prohibited assistance to the Contras, there was nothing more we could do than to buy our time. To help pay for the continuing bloodshed in Nicaragua, Reagan's men secretly sold arms to Iran. The American dollar and the failures of the armed left crushed Latin American revolutionary dreams. The United States saw a threat to their interests because they thought it was a communist struggle. They didn't see us as citizens who wanted a democratic country where there was social justice and which offered opportunities to the majority. The Cold War cost Latin America the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. In Nicaragua alone, 50,000 died in the Sandinista Revolution, and another 50,000 died in the Civil War. It was atrocious. There were a lot of deaths, a lot of suffering, a lot of refugees, a lot of population movement. On the other hand, I think uh, an equally, if not more compelling case can be made that had we not done something to stop communist regimes from being established in the other Central American countries, other than Nicaragua, say that they've been established in uh, El Salvador and then in Guatemala and possibly even Honduras during the 1980s, if we hadn't taken the steps that we took, I think the immediate suffering could have even been uh, considerably greater. 1990, Sandinista leader Daniel Ortega asks the Nicaraguan people to vote him president. So they backed down and agreed to the uh, free elections. And who wins that election? Ortega's opponent narrowly won a surprise victory. Washington spent nearly $10 million backing her campaign. What, the United States spends money trying to influence the outcome of an election in another country? Who would ever do that? I mean, where does that ultimately happen in other countries and so forth? Yeah, I mean, it happens. We saw it in the very early stages of the Cold War with Italy, and don't be surprised if it's happening later in the Cold War, and don't be surprised if it still happens in the world today. Who wants to influence the outcome of American elections? Yes, all kinds of different people that want to influence the outcome of American elections, including Americans themselves. All right, now, in your notes, let's go ahead and flip over to, um, uh, let me see, that would be on page three, episode number 19. This is going to focus in particular on 1977, 1981. We're going to look at the big picture, so not just the Latin American part. We've been looking at that. That's taken us through, and we'll come back and look at it some more. Now we're going to get right to the hub of the Cold War. United States and the Soviet Union, and look at some of the issues and so forth that are involved there. Okay? Let me give you the notes on this, and then we'll transition. Actually, I'm going to pause at different points to show you 
some clips, including one of a hockey game. You're like, hockey? What the heck does hockey have to do with the Cold War? I mean, I know it's cold, right? Because you play hockey on ice, right? Yeah, you know it's the Soviet Union against the U.S. And who won? Do you believe in miracles? A bunch of U.S. college guys go up against, like, the awesome Soviet team and win? Oh, my gosh, that was awesome. That was, like, in uh, 1980, the winter of 1980, right about this time of year. And we beat the Soviets. <laughs> I'm like, why do so many people care about the outcome of a hockey game? Because this is, yeah, because we beat them, man. I was about your age when this was taking place. In fact, this was like, yeah, it was, uh, let me see, 19, I graduated in 1981, in, uh, in, in May of 1981. I think it was May or June. Anyway, it was a long time ago. But, yeah, I mean, these, were, these, these events that we're talking about, this is part of my experience. I mean, the stories I'm going to be telling you is like the Iran, the hostages, and so forth. I was there the day they came back. Yeah, it was really cool. It was wild. It was like, wow. So here we go, 1977, Jimmy Carter comes in, right? Write this down, you ready? Jimmy Carter, we got him as the new president, okay, 1977. Um, and he's, his presidency started interesting because they did the inauguration at the Capitol building. That's where they do it, on the west-facing lawn, looking to the Washington Monument in the distance. Um, he was inaugurated. And then he, they have the parade from the Capitol building to the White House, and then, you know, the president watches the rest of the parade, and they've got, like, bands and different things from different parts of the country go by. And I don't know, it's a, it's a really cool thing. Jimmy Carter did something on that day to sort of show, I'm somebody different. You know what he did? Instead of driving in the uh, car, he got out and walked the entire way. And if you're like, well, that's impressive. I mean, it is kind of impressive. Although, on January 6th of this year, how many people walked the other direction from the White House where they had a big rally, to the Capitol building where they continued the rally. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, so it's not that far. I want to say it's just over a mile, maybe, from the White House to the Capitol building, either direction. Okay? So Jimmy Carter comes in, and he gets to deal with the Soviet Union. Just make a note of this. How long will Jimmy Carter be our President of the United States? Four years, yeah. He ran for re-election. He was defeated by Ronald Reagan. So it starts out really positive. There were a lot of people are feeling positive. I mean, because we've just been through, I mean, Gerald Ford was the one he beat, and Gerald Ford had been Nixon's vice president. But a lot of people, okay, we're going to put the Republicans behind. Because the Watergate thing, that really hurt the Republicans. I mean, they lost, they already had, they were already in the minority in the House and the Senate, and then they lost the presidency. So the Democrats were in charge in 1977. It happens sometimes. In American history, one political party is associated with some terrible event. <laughs> and then the other, part, the other party is like, remember? So like how long are the Republican Party is going to be like tarnished with Watergate? No. Reagan will get elected in 1980. Stuff happens. How long will the Democratic Party be tarnished with uh, the Civil War? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, let me see. The next Democrat we're going to get elected is going to be Grover Cleveland. Whoa. We got Republican Lincoln. Repub well, Johnson doesn't count so much. Republican Grant for two terms. Rutherford B. Hayes, Republican. James Garfield, Republican. Chester Arthur, Republican. Grover Cleveland. And he wasn't elected, I'm looking over here, until like 1884. I tell you what, historically... <laughs> the Republicans would take, they would call it the bloody flag of rebellion. And go, yeah, who started the Civil War? <laughs> going to vote for those Democrats? I don't know. Is there any concern among Republicans today that the Democrats might uh, <coughs> talk about certain things that have taken place within the last some odd days and use that for political advantage? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is interesting because I've read some of the articles about what should Republicans do? Should they you know, defend Trump and vote against impeachment, yada, 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 or should they <laughs> cut it off because there may be some political advantages to put that behind them and move toward, like, being the party that's against things like, I don't know, marching from Washington or from the, the White House to the Capitol and breaking in and stuff like that. So it's an interesting thing because I tell you what, 
in American politics, if one side makes a mistake, does the other side let them like <laughs> go off easy or do they take advantage of it? They definitely take advantage of it, exactly. All right, so Jimmy Carter comes in. He's the president, so he's in charge of all this stuff. And he's got to work with the Soviet Union. And um, one of the things that he has an advantage of, write this down, in the Soviet Union, um, it's pretty clear, if you haven't been paying attention, that the economy is not doing well. Okay? So write that down. The economy is not doing well in the Soviet Union. And apathy has started to prevail. High, they're spending a lot of money trying to keep up with the United States and defense spending. But when you have a closed economy and you spend more of your money on defense stuff, that means you spend less on consumer goods. In the Soviet Union, yeah. I mean, so people are make, they're like, oh, we got to get all excited about, yeah, you know, so it's like, yeah, living standards poor. Who's the leader of the Soviet Union as you go in the latter part of the 70s? Oh my gosh, are you kidding? Stalin's been dead since 1953. Thank you, Brezhnev. But he's not that far from death either. Write that down. Brezhnev is very old in the latter part of the 1970s. Uh, geriatric, I think, is the word that they use to describe that. I mean, there's one meeting where I think there's like some agreement and so forth that they signed with President Carter. You'll get to watch it and so forth. Everyone's watching. And of course, Brezhnev is like approaching him, you know, to shake hands, right? And he what? <laughs> Did you just say he kissed him? No. <laughs> well, no, you can write that down. He kissed him. Because, I mean, that's what they do, diplomatic and so forth. Right, and you go, you get, you, if you guys pal up with, did you guys get a chance to like make good friends with any of the exchange students and so forth that were here? I did. did. you? Okay, yeah, I mean, we used to have exchange students at this school. And anyway, and Europeans have different ways of greeting and things and so forth. We're like fist bumps and elbow bumps and things like that. But I mean, some of those countries just like a, a, a peck on the cheeks, right? Not a slobbery wet kiss, but a peck on the cheeks. I mean, that's lip diplomatic. It's also diplomatic for like the leaders of countries to do that, Brezhnev included. Is that diplomatic in America? Do we do that in America? No. So it actually was weird because there was this whole little brouhaha about is Brezhnev going to try and kiss Carter on the cheek and is that a sign of weakness and so forth? It's like, oh my God. And sure enough, Brezhnev's like, you know, getting his big old puckers ready for a, a kiss on the cheek. And both cheeks because you got to move, but you got to time it just right because otherwise you end up like making contact where you're not necessarily intending. <laughs> anyway, whatever. <laughs> it's like... So Brezhnev is the leader, and he's old, he, he, he doesn't see as well, he's not on the top of his game. Once we start getting into the 1980s, he's not going to last too long. I think he dies in like 81 or 82. Um, and so then you'll get a series of other, two more leaders that are very old, and then Gorbachev comes in. Yeah, so, yeah, Khrushchev, no, not Khrushchev, Khrushchev, yeah, the other direction, yeah. Mm. So you'll get like Chernyenko and Andropov, you don't need to worry so much about them. And then Gorbachev is the last one. We'll spend a lot of time talking about him in this unit. So one of the things that uh, is a big issue is human rights issues. Write this down. I mean, we've got Jimmy Carter, who is making human rights a very important point. And a lot of members of Congress are pushing on human rights. Yes? Yeah, in, in a sense, we do, right? I mean, this is, as we, I mean, think of it this way. By the time we get to the end of the 1980s, we're wrapping up with the Cold War. Who won? Our economy was doing better compared to the Soviet economy. What sort of economic system are they using there? Yeah, command economy, the state is control of everything, and does that work to create, generate lots of economic progress and so forth? No, I mean, we have ups and downs, you know, in our country and so forth, but generally in the long run, we outperform. All right, so human rights is an issue. Human rights pressure, we push on the Soviet Union. Congress, the president, and others are saying, come on, Soviet Union, you need to do better. Here's some examples. Do you see in your notes the uh, part that talks about uh, uh, Charter 77? Do you see that? Charter 77? Right, you guys see that? Yep. That came out of Czechoslovakia which is obviously part of the Warsaw Pact, dominated by the Soviet Union. Some dissidents wrote that charter, including Václav Havel. We've seen him before uh, during the Prague Spring in 1968, um, in which they are 
accusing the Soviets of mistreating and violating human rights. And you're like, whoa, what, did the Soviets ever sign an agreement that they were going to, like, honor human rights? Yes, the Helsinki Treaty. Oh. Ashton, which American president signed the Helsinki Treaty that said, hey, we're gonna, this, this, um, this allows us to say you're in violation of this treaty if you're not respecting human rights? I'll give you a clue. It was the president before Carter. It's not Chevy, it's not Dodge, it's not General Motors, it's a Ford, yes, okay, it's a Ford. Yeah, the, yeah, so it's coming out of uh, Eastern Europe, okay? And so, you know, we're monitoring what is going on in the Soviet <laughs> Union and in Eastern Europe. Um, here, and some of the things, I mean, are just really horrible, what they're doing. I mean, they're like uh, mistreating uh, people in their own country. Um, Somebody who's like a political dissenter might be like, write this down, identified as having mental illness and forced into a mental hospital and given really high, high dosages of like psychotic drugs and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's horrible. Yeah. This was happening in Eastern Europe and it was happening in the Soviet Union. Okay. Here's one example of a guy, Andrei Sakharov, write his name down. Andrei Sakharov was a Soviet citizen who was critical of the Soviet Union. Now, we knew Andrei Sakharov because until he became critical of the government, he was working for the government. And he had built up a lot of respect. He was a nuclear physicist. Right? So he'd been working on like the, the Soviet nuclear weapons program and so forth. And um, he begins to express his uh, opinions uh, critical of the Soviet government. Okay. There were a lot of Jews in the Soviet Union who were being critical of the Soviet government. Many of these Jews referred to as refuseniks, right? Refuseniks, they were dissidents. Um, one of the things they really wanted was just the ability to freely go. Well, Libby, where do you suppose they would want to go? And live forever out of the Soviet Union where they were being mistreated. Israel's right, yeah, Israel, yeah. So if you go to Israel, you actually find there is a significant uh, proportion of the population that are Jews who had come out of Russia or the Soviet Union at different times, okay? One of them is going to be Anatoly Sharansky. Do you see his name in there? Anatoly Sharansky, Soviet, Jew, dissident, refusenik, critical of the Soviet Union, given 13 years in prison in the year 1978. 13 years in prison, okay? I think totally Sharansky, yeah. Um, yeah, and so to the extent that, like, word comes out, this is the thing that happens. You get somebody that's mistreated by some of these dictatorial countries. They want their names to be known outside so that the West, the United States, and other countries can say, hey, what's going on with here? We want to talk to this person. We want to see that this person is still alive. I mean, you still hear that happen today. I think there was, like, Somebody, I was reading some article about like Jack Ma, who is like a very successful uh, businessman in China. You know about that? Well, it's kind of like he got quieted because he was being kind of critical of the Chinese Communist government. And then like people looking around going, where is he? He's gotten like real, real quiet. What do you, who do you suppose might have put some pressure on him to shut up? Perhaps the Chinese, the, the, perhaps the Chinese Communist government. Yeah, so I mean, some of those things that are still kind of transpiring and so forth today, this is what we're talking about back in the late 1970s, okay? So uh, Sharansky is getting pressure on him. Meanwhile, you ready? Take a little bit of a different tack here. Carter picks up the mantle that Nixon and Ford had had before that of negotiating for a new nuclear weapons treaty. Write this down. A new treaty that would limit ballistic missiles. Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty number two. So these are the SALT II negotiations or talks. So Carter's group comes in and they're negotiating with Brezhnev's group over, can we put some more limits on strategic weapons? Does that make sense? Now notice, remember the last time when Nixon did a SALT treaty with the Soviet Union? They put the limit above the number of weapons that each side had. And these are long distance weapons, right? Like the ballistic missiles. 
somebody suggested maybe they should include short and medium range missiles in the negotiations. And I want you to write this down. In the 1970s, late 1970s, yes? These are like additions, yeah. It's kind of like the idea was to maybe ramp it, make it, make it a little bit more um, inclusive, maybe drop the numbers a little bit so that there wasn't so much room for either side to grow the number of weapons they had. So it's like a continuation of that. The Soviets have been putting in SS-20s. You want to write this down. SS-20s. This is a weapon that the Soviets had developed. It's a nuclear missile, but it's a medium-range nuclear missile. It can only go up to like 3,000 miles. So is it dangerous to the United States? <laughs> Not when launched from the Soviet Union, but it could be aimed at our Western European allies. Write this down. Some of the Western European allies were expressing concern that the Soviet Union had been putting these missiles to think like, I don't know, maybe if they got into a war and they just attacked Western Europe, maybe the United States would back down. So then you got this huge debate going on in Western Europe of, I don't know, should we have short and medium range U.S. nuclear missiles stationed in Western Europe pointed at the Soviet Union? And some of the countries are like, yeah, we'll feel more secure because that way, you know, if they launch and hit Western Europe, they're going to be hitting U.S. military servicemen as well as our missiles. And then we can launch our missiles shortly over there. By the way, write down these missiles. Pershing missiles are the short, I want to say medium range missiles that the United States develops. Pershing. Oh, remember that Pershing, the United States overall commander in World War I? They named it after him. I, I think I have that in there. Nope, okay, never mind. Pershing. Yeah, we got the SS 20s. R S H I N G. And then also cruise missiles. Those are cool. Those are a new uh, advancement that the United States came up with first. Anybody have any idea what a cruise missile is or how it works? Now, ballistic missile goes up, and it kind of has an arc and comes down. What is a cruise missile? Yeah. Is it more like it kind of goes up and then just fires straight? Yeah, it flies like an airplane. I mean, it requires a really high rate of technology to do that. So you can't really detect it way up high in the sky because you launch it and then it just basically flies like an airplane kind of under, you know, radar detection and so forth. I mean, it's really sophisticated. Cruise missiles, we came up with them first. You can launch them from the ground. You can launch them from submarines. So the Pershing missiles were land-based short, medium-range missiles. I forget if they're short or medium-range, but those are the ones that we're considering uh, stationing in Western Europe. And of course, with Western Europe, it becomes complicated because some Western European countries are like, mm, no, let's not do that. And other ones are like, yeah, let's do that. In any event, you have big, huge debates in those countries as to whether or not they feel like they wanted to have those U.S. missiles placed there. Oh, by the way, in Eastern Europe, did they get to have big debates over whether or not the Soviet Union placed short and medium range missiles there? No, because they've got the Red Army there. <laughs> Soviet Union is basically like, we will put our missiles there. That is what's going to happen. So ultimately, there will be a treaty signed. Write this down. June 1979, the SALT II Treaty will be signed in Vienna. Okay? Here's what you need to know about the SALT II Treaty. Limitation on long-range nuclear missiles. It does not include the SS-20s. It does not include Pershing missiles. It does not include cruise missiles. It's just the ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, the long, long range. And frankly, if you look really close at it, it wasn't that much different than the treaty that was already in place, SALT-1. Uh, June of 1979, and that's where they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Brezhnev kissed um, Carter on the cheek. Other people are like, well, else, what else came out of it? Um, that was about it. It, it, cre it, it continued the restrictions on long range, the number of long range missiles that could be ultimately developed. Okay, so it's a little bit more of an increase there, but not a significant difference. Although, write this down. 
Uh, there were people that are like, oh, we need to make this treaty better. Ronald Reagan opposed it. And you're like, who's Ronald Reagan? Former governor of California? That's nice. Republican? Okay. Ran for president against Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination in 1976? Lost. So? So why does Ronald Reagan's opinion matter as in, the 19, in 1979 and 1980? Because he's going to end up being the Republican nominee for president in 1980. Oh, and by the way, he's going to win. He didn't trust the terms of how it kind of came through. He was critical. Yeah. So that's what's going on there. Meanwhile, something really hits the fan. Are you ready? This is going to be bad. I mean, it was fascinating because I remember when Jimmy Carter came in, when he was running for office, he smiled all the time. I remember the cartoons showed him with these big grinning teeth and everyone, and, and he's like, you know, everyone just felt pretty good about him. Even if you didn't agree with everything, you're like, wow, I mean, Watergate's in the past, and he's all happy and everything. Put this down. By 1979 and 1980, he's frowning a lot. He, Jimmy Carter, he is not happy. Stuff happens on his watch that he's going to be like, man, this sucks. This is terrible. Oh, my gosh. What should we do? Well, the country decided, a majority, bring in another president. And they bring in Reagan, and he's like sunny optimism and so forth. Still has to deal with a lot of the same issues. But, yeah, being president can wear on you. Oh, my gosh. And Jimmy Carter was pretty worn out. Here's what happened. Big thing. You ready? November 4th, 1979. November 4th, 1979. Write it down. It happened in Iran. It happened in the capital city of Iran. The capital city of Iran is Tehran. Okay? Mm -hmm. It happened in the capital city. It happened at the United States Embassy in Tehran. The United States Embassy, which, had, you know, that's where we have in other countries. We have diplomatic relations. They have an embassy in our country with all their diplomats and people. And we have our embassy in other countries with our diplomats and other people, right? Well, something happened in the late 1970s that made the country, Iran, really start hating the United States. They overthrew their previous government. The previous government was led by a man whose title was, you ready, Shah of Iran. S-H-A-H, Shah, so think of it as like czar, okay? I don't want to give you the full name and so forth, but he was, he was our guy. We supported him. Yeah, he was a dictator. Yeah, he repressed his people way too much. But by gosh, he was our friend in the Middle East. And when the Soviet unions got Iraq as a friend and Syria as a friend and all these other ones and, and Egypt for a while, and, and we could count on Iran. And we gave him money and military support. In fact, write this down. We provided him some of the best military equipment. This is like leading up until when he's overthrown. The Shah will be overthrown. I want to say like 1979, earlier that year. The Shah is going to be overthrown. And the new guy that comes in, <laughs> he hates the Shah. The Shah is lucky to have gotten out of the country alive. And he hates the United States. His name is the Ayatollah. His title, name in there, didn't I? Yes, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Yes, versus the Shah of Iran. The Ayatollah Khomeini is an Islamic fundamentalist. When he wins, guess what kind of government he will establish in Iran? A religious extreme government. Okay. Not democracy, not per se, but who's going to be in charge there? The Ayatollahs, and he's the number one Ayatollah. Yeah, it's like a title. Yeah, it's like Pope. Yeah. Okay, you got that? So you're like, okay, so they're mad. <laughs> but we still have an embassy there. We still got people. We're trying to establish, like, normal relations and so forth with him. But he's so mad, you know what he does? Uh, he's like, he does nothing when... Iranians break into the United States Embassy and take it over. And they take the United States Embassy personnel hostage. That's not what you do with other people's like embassy personnel in your country. I mean, that is like strictly against the rules. So Carter's like, what do I do with these guys? What do I do? 
Because they're like, I mean, they're thinking, they're, I mean, they're going to kill these guys because, I mean, they're mad at the United States. Here's one thing. Look at the Argo. I'll tell you this. Argo was a movie made about this time period. This came out many, many years after, after we found out what really took place. Write this down. Those hostages will be kept for 444 days throughout the remainder of Carter's presidency. I remember on television each night, they were like an hostage update. And it always started with the day, you know, like day 355. I mean, it was just like, ooh, it just got to you. It was just depressing. And Carter did try to do something about it. <clears throat> In April of 1980, so what is that, like about six months after the, uh, the hostage takeover, he sent the military in. The United States military went on a rescue mission. Only it didn't quite work out. McKinley, the United States military, they were like going to a staging area in the Iranian desert and we had like an aircraft and a bunch of helicopters and so forth, but the winds were whipping up and the sand got in the equipment and some of the equipment didn't work out very well. In fact, one of the helicopters hit one of the planes and blew up and killed eight servicemen. And, we, and, then, we, and then we got out. We didn't finish the job. We didn't like go and get the hostages out. So the Iranians were like, woohoo, you suck America. This is... You know, Allah is shining uh, praise upon us. They're on our side. And we're like, and the Americans are like, oh, we tried and failed, and now these hostages are still there. It took a lot of days before the Iranians finally did free the hostages. Do you know when they freed them? January 20th, 1981, the day that Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, becoming the next president. Now, whose administration actually negotiated for the release of the hostages? Jimmy Carter's negotiation. But Iran just wanted to, like, stick it in the eyeball of Jimmy Carter by not releasing the hostages until Ronald Reagan literally, like, took the oath of office that day. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Hello, yeah. But meanwhile, one of the things we didn't know, there were some U.S. Embassy personnel that were not in the embassy. They were, like, in Tehran, and then when they saw what was happening, the embassy taken over, they are like, Woo, we're not going back there. They hung out at the Canadian embassy. There were, like, I want to say four of them, four U.S. Embassy personnel in the Canadian embassy. And the Canadian embassy is really cool. They're like, oh, we don't got anybody here. <laughs> But eventually, you know, the Iranians are going to, like, find them. And then the CIA had to figure out, how do we get these guys out? So Tony Mendez, you can see him here in the middle. That's where he is at that time. And there he is, older. Tony Mendez comes up with an idea. And it's a crazy idea, and it just worked. He's going to send a fake Hollywood movie crew into Tehran pretending that they're going to be like filming different things and so forth for some sci-fi adventure movie. And then they're going to get the American, the four of them, and they're going to get them out. And it just worked. While you're wiping it down, I'll play you the, the, the trailer. It was Ben Affleck's movie. He got to play Mendez. And Mendez worked with my teacher buddy over at Bora when my teacher buddy was in the CIA before he became an econ teacher in Boise, Idaho. And he's like, oh my gosh, the Canadians got all the credit for it, but in fact, it was the CIA that pulled it off. It was crazy. All right, let me show you the clip, and you guys can wipe down, and then you can go. I'd recommend this movie. It's pretty cool. Six, sorry, not four. Brian Cranston's in it, too. A miracle. John Goodman plays the fake movie producer. Argo. The 
best bad idea we have. Oh, by the way, all of the uh, documents that were shredded are being put back together by Iranian uh, seamstresses. Did they get out? Heck yeah. Yes. U. S. A. <laughs> yeah, it's not entirely true. Most of it's true. They have like a big chasing at the airport at the very end that was made up, but otherwise. All right, adios. We'll get into the hockey one next time. <laughs>